Hello, how is everyone today? I hope everyone is well. I'll start my camera in just a second. I need to clean my desk off. I keep all this stuff here and I really shouldn't. It gets in the way. I hope everybody's having a good weekend so far. Does anybody have any good weekend plans? Oh, and don't judge my makeup. Hi. Ray J, Renee, Lou. I'm doing a show on Edie Sedgwick on Monday, who is like my idol. So I was going to do my makeup like hers. So I was testing out today. So it might not look exactly great. But Robson, more beer. So how is everyone's weekend going so far? Good, I hope. My Edie Sedgwick makeup. Oh, I even got the earrings that she wore. So I'm really excited about that. So, yeah, that's going to be Monday. Hi, Stoney. So, yeah, this weekend's kind of boring. My roommate's gone. My kids aren't here. I need to get to a lot of stuff. He would be like, oh, I can get to do all that stuff, reading emails and stuff. Hi, Marie Swan. So today we are going to be talking about Sada Abe. Lou and Robson. Has anybody heard of her before? I read about her first in this book in college, Bad Girls of Japan. Which a lot of the stuff, what I hate, what I love about research. Hi, Talana. I love researching. But what I hate about research is certain things aren't on the internet. No matter how broad and why the internet is, you can't always find everything on there. And like... What I hated about this is there were so many different conflicting accounts, even when I watched like other people's videos. So that's when I find it really good to actually have books because uh, most books, if they're like used in certain universities or academic settings, have most of the credible evidence in it. So this one kind of took more of a turn towards like um, gender stuff. Hi, Susan. All right. Well, Sada Abe was a geisha in the 30s that ended up killing someone, obviously. So this one gets a little spicy. So we'll just... Hi, Crusher. Yeah, it's like... Yeah, this one, it's not like they're not all killers. Sada Abe is the one that is a killer. But it talks about a lot of different women in Japanese culture and how their deviance is viewed as bad. But when reality, maybe some of them aren't bad. Hi, Phil. Yeah, everything's going well. So I want to thank everyone again. I've had a lot of people send donations, which aren't expected. I don't feel like you have to. I've had people send me gifts, and they've been so nice and so kind. It's been so nice to be able to actually pay some bills for once. That's always a great feeling. So I actually ordered a desk. So unfortunately, even though I just got this whole YouTube set up, it's going to be moving into my bedroom. So I'll just have to learn to keep my room clean. So we're going to start off then with the PowerPoint presentation, of course, uh, with a geisha, Does any, which I thought was really important because this uh, video, like I'm going to be talking about you, prostitution and geisha. But I just wanted to make sure everybody, thank you, Robson. I wanted to make sure that everybody understood what a geisha was. A geisha is by no means a prostitute of any kind. Um, that was something that was kind of like etched into stone after America's occupation during World War II. Uh, because during that time, the Japanese economy before America kind of set everything up for them was kind of down because of the war being bombed or whatever. So a lot of women ended up uh, dressing up like geisha in the kimonos and stuff or gave the impression that they were geisha when they were actually just normal street prostitutes. So Westerners got the impression that geisha were working women of the lustful kind when they really weren't. Geisha are actually like the highest form of entertainers in Japanese culture, and they embody everything the height of Japanese aestheticism. Uh, it's about learning like the art of music, like playing the shamisen, uh, the art of conversation, the art of dance, of uh, pouring tea. There's people spend, uh, women spend their entire lives training to be geisha and not all of them make it. So I just wanted to make it very clear that Abe Sada did train in a geisha house for some time, but 
she was very low on the geisha hierarchy so she wasn't very she wasn't totally a geisha but that's how she's been labeled she was mostly a prostitute that kind of left the scene of geisha because she wasn't able to make it so i just wanted to make that clear so let's go on so this is an old picture of the geisha i could actually do a show on geisha if you want me to it's very interesting like the amount of training that goes in there i don't know if anybody's seen that um movie memoirs of a geisha hi indigo viper that's a good movie but it's not all completely true but it's still good when you like look at it in the terms of the amount of dedication and work that it takes into being that so let's go on so in the early life uh abe sada came from a family of eight children uh they were kind of upper middle class uh what was interesting is almost all the children died except four um they seemed like a normal family but not everything was as it seemed some of her siblings such as her sister lived kind of a promiscuous lifestyle her older brother was kind of a womanizer and got arrested for domestic violence at once but she was a rather independent child in the beginning and she her mother and uh helped promote the love of the shamisen which is something that geisha normally play and she became infatuated with like the extravagance and the art that went into that and she was doing good for a while but then unfortunately when she started leaving the confines of her home she came mixed up in the wrong crowd and she eventually became sexually assaulted at the age of 15. Uh, she was raped by a university student and that kind of crushed her because that kind of shuts down prospects of marriage having sex before marriage losing her virginity in that way was rather traumatic to her and that would also label her as a uh, deviant and kind of the slut label um to other members of japanese society and would not bring honor or anything to her family so people were more concerned about the appearances and the image that it would bring upon her and her family more so than a girl being sexually assaulted so it was i could not find any pictures of her for her youth but the picture there is was taken in May 19th, 1936 in Kyoto, in, what is it, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, she was 31 years old. So after the sexual assault, she became a little unruly. She was having some behavioral problems. And her father ended up selling her to a geisha house, or as the book that I was reading said, sold into prostitution. In 1922, um, it's, I wouldn't say she was particularly sold into prostitution. She was sold to a geisha house. But when you get to a geisha house, most of these women that are in there, she was at the bottom of the hierarchy, had been training in the arts of dance, conversation, and whatnot, like I described earlier, since their young teenage years, or they were born into that geisha system. So they were so much more experienced in so she was really at the bottom so i heard that some of the geisha were actually very jealous of her because even though she didn't have that training she had a lot of more real world experience and she was a little bit more educated on the outside world and in different academic topics than some of the other geisha were so she was kind of popular with clients in terms of that because she can hold a conversation beyond just you know what the geisha would know in the world so she wasn't too fond of the strict world because there's a very strict rules and regulations of being a geisha in terms of what you can do, who you can see. Uh, you're not allowed to sleep around, that kind of stuff. And she began to be kind of ostracized by other members in the house. So she ended up becoming a prostitute in the Osaka Topita district in Japan. And, um, she ended up doing that and ended up contracting syphilis, which at that time it was a manageable disease. It wasn't curable. So she had to go through a lot of routine examinations and stuff that other geisha didn't have to. So she just decided to stick to being a prostitute at that time. And plus it brought in better money for her because she wasn't getting that much clientele working at the geisha house just because she wasn't seen as experienced. And this is one of her pictures on the left-hand side. So she ended up being arrested in 1934 because you could be a prostitute in Japan if you were registered with the government. You could be a licensed prostitute. But she was uh, working in an unlicensed brothel. So that's how she got arrested. 
And then after a time, she ended up uh, le left the life of being a prostitute because she wanted to, she was sick of the way men were treating her. Because even if you are a prostitute, you it's like, think about it in the business sense. Just go in, do what you need to do, still be respectful. It doesn't matter if a woman is a waitress or a prostitute. If that's the profession she wants to do, let her do it. But there has to be boundaries and expectations that you should treat somebody regardless of their profession. And she just wasn't being treated very nicely. So um, she ended up um, leaving the, the work of a prostitute and began to work at a restaurant that was owned by a gentleman named Yoshida Kichizo. And they ended up um, getting a little bit of an attraction um, to each other. Everybody could see that it was obvious. And he was known for being somewhat of a ladies' man, though he was married, which is interesting because I'll tell you more later. But, yeah, he was married. So she ended up being the mistress of him for around three months. But she still didn't like the, the role of being a mistress. She wanted to fall in love and stuff. And she had this like a huge delusional imagery in her head that like some way that maybe Kichizo would leave his wife. But that just is not realistic in Japanese culture, even for somebody to leave. I'm just kind of looking at the, ch the chat. I love you too, Shirley McDonald. So this is not... Um, an actual picture of Sada Abe. There's a lot of movies made from it. And in court, I was read. they read an excerpt of, um, well, a statement from um, her at court about one of their little rendezvous. She said, the evening of May 16th, I got a top of Ashida, and at first we had sex while I pressed his throat with my hands, but that didn't do anything for me. So I wrapped my kimono sash around Ashida's neck, and I pulled it tight and then loosened it. And so... So on while we were having sex, while I was doing it, I kept looking down there. So I didn't realize that I'd squeezed too hard. Yoshida let out a moan and suddenly his thing got small. I was shocked and released the sash, but Ashida's face and neck had turned red and didn't return to normal. So I tried cooling his face by bathing it with water. So she was into autoerotic asphyxiation. So does everyone know what autoerotic asphyxiation is? And I guess... I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what I'm into. I might have dabbled a little bit in this field. And I know that, like, chemically speaking, when it comes with your brain, that this is, like, a big turn on because if somebody does this when you're able to breathe again and when you're doing certain sexual things, like, the pleasure mixed with all of that oxygen hitting your brain, like, makes it really intense, apparently. And, again, I'm not going to say what I'm into or not. So that's the stream for a different day. But, uh, yeah, so she was into that. So he was a little creeped out about it, mentioned some stuff about maybe I should go back to my wife. Maybe I shouldn't be with this woman who's trying to strangle me with my, her kimono sash. Maybe, yeah, safe words are needed. My safe word is Dwight. So <laughs> just because when are you ever going to say Dwight during sexual intercourse? Unless their name was Dwight. So then I guess you have to change it. There was the Chinese that bound their feet. That's an interesting thing, too. You guys, if you want to see something gross, look up Chinese women bind, feet binding. I don't think they do it anymore, but I think they're... So, yeah. So, um, Yoshida was like, maybe I should go back to my wife. Maybe I should put this on hold a little bit, put the brakes on this. So... He talked to her about possibly going back to his wife and ending the relationship. And that's made Abe Sada very mad. So one night while they were having sex, she went a little too far. She ended up um, asphyxiating Yoshida until he died. And then after that, she took a kitchen knife and severed his penis. She cut, she, I think, who was it, Lorena Bobbitt, his penis right off. Because what was the object of her affection and what was the reason that um, Kichizo was so drawn to her was for what she could do for him and what he wanted was pleasure. So she just cut it right off. And I'm trying to, I mean, at least she did it after he was dead. At least I hope he was dead. The reports really didn't say, but in the book I read, it said that she asphyxiated him until he expired, and then she cut off his dick. 
And then on top of that, what I thought was really interesting, she carved into his left thigh, uh, Sadakichi Futari, which Futari means together or two of us. So Sadaichi together and Kiri, which is like, um, I believe that's like to cut. So like the Sadakichi, the two who are cut and they like put off from the rest of the world. So like she couldn't have him because she was the mistress. But then overall, at the end of the day, she kind of won because she threw this carving into his skin and her taking his life. She sort of bound them in this like afterworld realm of monogamy because the ultimate monogamy because monogamy because she took his life. Uh, Lorena. Angela, that's so fun. Yeah, she pulled a bob it. She sure did. So, um, and she ended up when she left the bot. Okay, let me back up a little bit. So, what was interesting to me about the fact that she carved those words into his side is because that kind of has some type of historical significance. Because during uh, the Tokugawa period in Japan, courtesans and stuff like that uh, would go to extreme lengths to show their devotion and affection to uh, their patrons and they would um, self-mutilate themselves by inscribing their names in their upper arms as well as cutting off their fingers i am sorry if i love you i'm not cutting my finger off for you half the time men stop talking to me after three days so i'm not going to jump the gun and cut my finger off especially for somebody that i know that i could never be with he better be like bill gates millionaire for me to even consider cutting my finger off which in today's age, no person is worth cutting your finger off for, at least after uh, six years of online dating. They're not even worth uh, walking outside. So she ended up wandering around the streets of Tokyo for a few, three days, I think it was. And she had uh, Yoshida's severed penis in her bag. I read multiple things that she went and saw a movie. I read that she tried to use his severed penis as a sex toy on her and get pleasure from it that she actually put it in her mouth to do some type of oral um pleasure but yeah she apparently she sexually messed around with a severed penis she wanted to keep it because apparently it was the best part of him and it was something that drew them together even after death yeah a tattoo is extreme enough yeah mutilation no cut yeah don't cut your finger off pressure i don't know what kind of people you're hanging out with but not for a million dollars so on may 21st 1936 she was actually arrested for it it was three days after the incident and this picture on the left that's actually where um she killed him and so and like i said earlier the token affection of the crime the penis and those are unverified reports because i've read from like six places that she did that but then the book that i read mentioned nothing of that and seeing how it's a book about trying to paint deviant females in a better light i think that if she would have done that that would have seemed like a sexually liberating thing to do seeing how she felt like she was kind of used by yoshida so i think that the book would have mentioned that and it never did so i was saying unverified so if somebody can verify that with like some first-hand documents uh let me know so she was arrested. Um, she told the cops what she did. She told them that she, there was claims of rape of her being a prostitute. They were completely ignored. She was kind of labeled as the Showa's poisonous woman, uh, which uh, she was added to the ranks of women that were deemed as disorderly and deviant as Japan. Uh, so poisonous women. Um, she... Oh, I forgot to look up with the word physiognomy <laughs> is something that's learned how to explain sexual deviance of women, which we're going to get into that. So the court was very, the whole court case was really interesting to me because she was sentenced to, I think it was 10 years, but she got out in 19, what, six years in prison. She only got for cutting off some dick. And I can tell you right now, if I can only get six years in prison, there's a few guys that I know that could have their dicks get cut off and they would be just fine. So um, six years in prison and she only she ended up getting out in 1940. So she ended up changing her name or went up. But I when I read in the book that was really interesting was the way that they conducted the trial. So even though it's not right what she did, I'm not condoning murder or anything. 
what she did was obviously bad. Killing somebody is always bad unless it's in self-defense, which nowhere did I read during this particular situation or in any of the situations. Did Yoshida ever abuse her? But in her time, like she was raped when she was 15. And I guess through a lot of her work, she was raped and abused and used. And that kind of has some type of bearing when it comes in your defense case, kind of lighten the blow or your image a little bit. So that could even explain to why some women would snap. So they totally disregarded that. They totally disregarded that this woman was abused before. She might have some things run her head mentally. They totally ignored that she was sold by her family into this lifestyle that led to this lifestyle that maybe she was mentally and her image of sex was maybe a little bit unwell. They also didn't even think they didn't even like, it's bad that Yoshida was dead. He didn't deserve to die, but he wasn't exactly, you know, the poster child for like, a male, the perfect male victim in terms of like, he was like maybe a pastor that was killed. Like he was had, he was known for being a ladies man and he was being um, not faithful to his wife. They completely threw that all out the window. They were mostly in to determining what about being a woman in particular, not about being an individual, but what about being a woman made her so sexually deviant? And I kind of that find of disgusting to me. They made her undergo 17 days of medical exams, psychologically and mostly physical. They made her testify on her period, somehow saying that her cycle of menstruation had something to do with this brink of insanity that she had. So, like, they're trying to explain this because as she... Like, because she was a woman and because she has a period, that's what made her snap. Uh, they also made her do a testimony on her losing her virginity to that university student when she was 15. At, and um, they said, I, it was just like the stuff that they made her testify about was ridiculous. Yeah, 17 days. So... The ver they said that the various medical studies about Sada repeatedly claim a connection between the murder of Kichigo and Sada's reproductive functions and sexual desire. So it was because she had a vagina and a uterus and her weird sexual desires that caused her to commit this crime. The PMS defense. Yeah, that's what they were saying. They said that uh, the way that you menstruate might lead to bad behavior. So I'm like, what the hell? Like, what does this have to do with anything? I, I can't believe, I mean, I guess whatever they did worked because like she obviously didn't really do any jail time. She was arrested in 1936. 37, she got out in four years. So I mean, but like still imagine having like you go through like somebody that committed this crime obviously wasn't well. I could see somebody that was abused and there was some reports that she might have been sexually like exposed to sexually explicit material and behavior at a younger age than when she was raped. So I'm thinking that somebody that was in that type of predicament, like getting up to that point where she's just getting so man after man after man is treating her wrong. She's drawn to the same type of man because that's the kind of like conditioning she had as a young woman when she's supposed to be learning like her sexual like groove and like what that, a good idea of what healthy sex is. So she gets here and I could imagine why I, I could see why she would snap. She has this image where she wants to be with somebody like any other normal woman or a man wants to be with somebody. And she finds somebody that she's into and that apparently re, re, what is the word reciprocated the feelings and she can't have them. And he's starting to pull away. I think that would cause anybody to snap if they had that type of lifestyle. So I could kind of see where that would happen. And I know right now my friend Chris is watching and I'm like butchering these words and I'm probably did some, uh, he does English and I probably did some bad grammar too. So don't hold it against me, please. Yeah. Male honor. It's all about male honor. So what was I going to do? They also um, said that she experienced episodes of nymphomania, that she was a sex freak. So, like, when you think about it from today's terms, 
Oh my gosh, like there's stuff like FetLife that has like a GPS locator that shows you where like all the sex parties are within like a 20 mile radius and like what the cover charges are. Sex is so open and liberated now. Like I feel like this wouldn't even be used as some type of like um, ways for her defense or like the prosecutor to even use now. So I guess maybe I'm just blown away about how this was done. And the trial was very descriptive. And there, some people even labeled it as kind of erotic. That is how descriptive and intense and terse. Basically, it wasn't even as if Sada was on trial for the murder. It was her sex life that was on trial. So they actually did come out, though, with an interesting little study. This is the last slide called the Psychoanalytic Diagnosis of Abe Sada. So they focused on her sexual deviancy, but they moved more away from the biological aspects of her being a woman and what we just talked about, more into the psychological, sort of like what causes a person to do this. Um, she was considered like um, a transgressive woman, and she became sort of symbolic of women in the time. Um, so that was like pre-war and post-war like kind of like imagery on her kind of changed and that study kind of provided a fresh shift in how people viewed her so um she was seen i was reading a little bit about freud do people read about freud anymore does everybody know who freud is hi third time productions so it was said that her behavior through this study did not illustrate a psychopathic vita sexualis, but was more of a deviation from a normal human behavior produced by an immature sexuality with limited access to normal sexual objects. So I could see that making more sense than saying her period made her do it. Uh, only women can kill and rage like this in sexual situations. Oh, look at, look at the check mark has joined. Hi, Ron. Everyone say hi to Ron. Hi, Rod. So, yeah. Freud did invent the slip. So, I think it would be... I, I, I just really wish that... I'm wondering how this type of trial would end up today. Like, I, I really didn't follow the Lorena Bobbitt situation. I don't know what happened with her. Hi, jerk off. So, yeah. They said that her limited access to normal sexual, like... um what is it to normal sexual objects and her immature sexuality is what caused this kind of deviance. But now auto, what an auto erotic asphyxiation is not deviant. Come on, admit it. We've all done a little bit of it. And we, some of us probably liked it. I'm not going to say. Oh, shut, shut up, Ron. So, uh, that's kind of where I, uh, ended off the study. I was just kind of going off this a little bit. So that's kind of like the Abe Sada thing. So this is some work that was done. This is kind of like the manga that came out with her. They came out with tons of movies. She even wrote a little bit of a kind of like bio, like a, like a autobiography in some other books. This was a picture of her afterwards, even looking at her afterwards when she got older, she doesn't look like the type of woman that's going to be a danger to society her entire life. I just honestly think that she just had you know, I mean, she probably just felt the way after I get after I've been ghosted 55 times in two years. She just lost her shit. So, <laughs> so that's what I'm thinking. So I don't know what your guys' opinions are. Let me shut this. So I'm also, I'll show you a little preview of. I'll show you a preview of what I'm doing Monday. I completely forgot I scheduled. I might have to move the cannibalism one thing around because I actually got to read a lot of it still. Uh, Monday, we're actually, if you have any questions, uh, I don't know. Like they said that she changed her name, uh, her family, her father and mother ended up dying, I think, before this happened. And, um, so she ended up changing her name and kind of hiding in the shadows. She did come out when somebody wrote a book about her and she said it was all trash. She actually went to court and sued him for libel, I think it's called. Thank you. These are uh, Steve Sasko, Edie Sedgwick earrings, which is what who our tragic beauty series is going to start off with. I'm going to show you a little bit 
about this. Uh, if anybody knows who Edie Sedgwick is, put a one in the chat. Because she's my spirit animal. Because we've been through a lot of shit. So this is this is who we're going to be talking about on Monday. And a lot of people... Hi, Truth Hurts. A lot of people don't know about who she was. Edie Sedgwick was known as the Factory Girl. She was one of Andy Warhol's 60 superstars. Uh, she There's a movie about her. It's called Factory Girl. It has um, Sienna Miller plays Edie Sedgwick, and then it has Jimmy Fallon in it. Hi, Chris. <laughs> so, yeah, so she's uh, a very interesting figure in history whose family uh, had a lot of... Um, they were a lot of high society people. Hi, Matt Gammy. So that's who we're talking about on Monday. And I was, hi, Effie. I was reading and watching some of the videos where she was talking and I cried. Like, I love this woman so much. There's people in Michigan that don't even know my name is Iko, that don't even know my name is Ashley. They straight up think my name is Edie. Like, I caught my hair once down to this short and like, an adoration of her to be like her. Like, my daughter's name Edie, okay? So, like, yeah, she is great in Factory Girl. And I actually made this. Ron, do you like my, like, early, like, 2000s web design that I did? <laughs> I'm so talented. I taught myself how to do web design at a very young age. So that stinted at, like, age, like, uh, 15. What was it? 12 to 15. So it all looks like a little girl blogger. So I'm not as talented as Ron is. No, it's okay. So... Uh, she's going to be in our tragic beauty series. And then we're also going to look at Anna Nicole Smith. Uh, I don't know if you guys know who Anna Nicole Smith is. She had a very tragic upbringing as well. And even though she was very, she did porno and stuff, she was kind of naive in the beginning. And I just think she got pulled in a lot of the wrong things and a lot of the way, like, like being famous and people pressuring her, like she was put down an even worse path afterwards. And unfortunately she died young as well. So that's going to be some of the people that we're, we're doing there. And then we're also doing the cannibalism thing. And then I'm also going to be doing something. Some other topics we're going to hit is the comfort women, the rape of non cane. Oh, there was one that somebody recommended that was uh, when we talked about the cannibalism. What is it? What was it that we talked about in the beginning? We talked about the Yakuza and how the emperor had ties to that unit in China that did basically the Chinese Holocaust on the Chinese civilians. We're going to be talking about that unit. So there's a lot. We're going to go. Yeah, she did marry a really old millionaire. So, I mean, if Anna Nicole taught us something, it was just make sure whoever is old that you're marrying does not have any kids. That's the key thing we can take from her. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at that unit. I think it was 731, maybe. I can't remember off the top of my head. And then we're going to be looking at the Rape of Nan King, which is a huge war atrocity that happened in China during World War II. I kind of wanted to focus on more of, um, I want to sort of investigate more into Korea. So any suggestions you guys have? I do read all the comments, and then people message me everywhere else and email me. I still have to go through everything. I am the worst. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anna's son OD'd too. It's really sad. So I was kind of uh, going to look at those kind of things. And then any other tragic women you can think of. I wanted to kind of do like, I'm not sure, but those are some of the kind of ideas. Yeah, she did have a long court battle. She did have a long court battle. And to be honest, I think that she did really love that guy because you can love somebody and not have sex. And I think that they made each other happy in their own way. And I think there was some type of connection there. So I think it was unfortunate that uh, she didn't get anything. Dorothy Stratton. I want to write that down. Dorothy Stratton. I like, I write down stuff on this little legal camp. Dorothy Stratton. Yeah, I mean, Sylvia Plath. Who's Sylvia Plath? I've never heard of her. So we're going to look at that kind of stuff. 
But there is more Asian stuff. I'm just kind of like going off a little bit because I was like, I want to talk about stuff that I'm passionate about. So I figured we'd do that. And then I think I'm getting close to being monetized. I have over a thousand subscribers. I have around 1,700 hours of watch time. I need 4,000 hours. So the bell jar. The bell jar. I'm writing this stuff all down. Because I tell Google all the time to save stuff and then I forgot how to look it up. So I'm just going to write it down. Yeah, my eyes kind of... Yeah, shit. I just need to find somebody to not ghost me after one day and I'll be happy. My expectations from dating went from super high to like, just don't drink a lot, I think is my only expectation now. Please. There, there is, oh, me and Ron today were talking about the dark side of K-pop. There's a lot of dark stuff down there. There's a lot of dark stuff down there that we could go into. I was thinking about looking at the Japanese cults. That's rather interesting. Japanese cults. So now that I have, because of the donations, I've been able to take some time off work. Thank God. Because I work during the day, 8 to 2, and then at my other job, I'll work 5 to 10, even though technically they want me to work 5 to midnight. No, it's okay, Band-Aids and Memories. I thank everyone. Stony, Band-Aids, all of you guys that have donated have been super helpful and sent me little gifts. It really brightens my day because I was really depressed earlier in April. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, I did go to the hospital for a week because I had, kind of had a tad bit of a mental breakdown and uh said some things about what i wanted to do to myself that i probably shouldn't have no i just have it back in a thing so like i i all the love and support of any kind is, is enough for me so i kind of want to talk about mental health too kareko fumiko i kind of want to talk about mental health too Maybe somehow tie it into something in the series about maybe like how Asia views it. Asia, like a lot of the medicine that I'm on now, you can't even get in Asia. Like amphetamines, they don't use them there. So, hi, Fro Freeze. I don't know how to press. Frost. Yeah, so everyone that is just, I love you guys all too. Everyone that, that messages, even if I don't respond right away, it's just I'm so busy because like I fall asleep a lot too. I'm not going to lie. So, yeah, I think we've all been there this year. Uh, so, yeah, I love you guys all, too. So sometimes I just get really sad, and I've been better lately. And I've kind of hit a lull because of anybody that takes medication. Like, when you're so sad for so long, you take medication, and it works. You feel on top of the moon. But then after a while, that top of the moon feeling kind of just, like, levels out. And you kind of hit, like, a barrier you're like when you stop taking your medicine so i kind of hit that barrier i'm still taking my medicine oh you're pretty smart how you doing it's always sunny hi belinda so it's just like i don't know i like to come on and just chat with everyone even though i don't talk about anything that you guys really want to listen to i just talk about random stuff but like it helps me so i don't know if i could help one person not be sad that would be my ultimate goal because, I don't know, I'm running out of vices that are healthy. I painted Stony. I started painting your painting. So I got to finish that. And then I have to paint this. This one's for myself. It's going to be like a gothic painting, and that's not. That's going to be blood. It's not going to be uh, tears because I'm extra like that. So... And I had about a, bought a lot more paint and stuff. Yeah. And then I got to paint you one, two band-aids and memories. I don't know if that counts truth hurts. What I did with Ron's channel is I would, I would leave for work for 15 hours. And I would start Ron's channel and just mute my TV on a playlist. And I would let it play through for 15 hours. And I would do that like six days a week when I would go to work. So, Yeah. You can thank me, Ron, for all of those wash hours. Because I did that for like four freaking months. So that's what I do is I just let them play. So I don't know. I don't know how it works. But today, guys, if you join my Discord, let me show you. Uh, if you go to justico.com, uh, 
I have my Discord here. And if you go to the Discord, we're going to be watching scary movies because I found a way to beat the blackout screen. So if you go to... Bestsego.com. In like an hour or so, we're going to watch Suspiria on the, the new one. And we're going to watch Reincarnation, which is done by Takahashi Shimizu. He's the one that did Ju on the Grudge series. So if you guys want to watch movies, it's going to be like in about an hour, I think. Maybe two hours, but probably most likely an hour. So we'll all get in the Discord and we'll just get into, they call it Ico's Party Hut, where we'll turn off our mics and our cams and I'll just stream it. I literally just upped my internet to the next package. So if the stream is running a little bit smoother with less uh, hiccups, that's why, because I wanted to play this. Uh, Suspiria might be a little flashy. So if you are like sensitive to lights or have like um, a seizure type of disorder, there are some scenes of flashing in Suspiria. Uh, I don't believe there is in reincarnation, but, um, yeah. Yeah. So like, we'll watch it with our mics or cams off. We'll watch it. And then like every so often we'll take a break and we'll just talk or whatever. So if you want to like go get a beer, a coffee, a cigarette, or go to the bathroom, you can. So like we, last weekend we watched the eye, the original version from China. And then the weekend before that we watched Neroi the curse. So we're going to watch two movies today. And I wanted to do a little bit of early for the UK people. All I got to say, though, is uh, I, I think Ron might be having a stream tonight. I'm not sure. But if he is, we'll take a little break from the movie and we'll go all join over to there. And then when he's done, we'll all come on back. So I'm awake like 24-7, basically. I take me mostly naps. I don't sleep. Yeah, so we're going to be heading over there. Now. Yeah. Yeah, so there might, for if you're epileptic, Suspiria might not be the best. But, yeah. But thank you all for coming. You guys all have a nice night. I love you. And if you guys are wondering what this is, it means I love you in like the Korean K-pop world or they do this, but I mostly do that. So you guys have a good night. Thanks for coming. Uh, and you guys have a good day. And I hope to see you in the Discord. The Discord is on justico.com. And yeah, I love you guys.